Welcome back to season two, episode six of Echo Akochi. I'm Andrea Chapman here with Joe Gochi, and our mission is to shed light on the lay voice. Throughout 2024, we'll be bringing you regular programming. Ikoji Buddhist Temple is located in Fairfax Station, Virginia. Join us for our in-person and streaming Sunday services at 11 a.m. Eastern or 8 a.m. Pacific and Dharma Breeze sessions led by Reverend Kurt Rye on Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern or 4 p.m. Pacific via Zoom. Ikoji also offers seminars, book and movie discussions, meditation sessions, and don't miss our annual Obon Summer Festival, which will be held on Saturday, July 13th from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Visit ikoji.org for more details. Joe, what more can you share about Ikoji? Thank you, Andrea. Ikoji is part of Buddhist Churches of America, a network of 60 Jodo Shinshu temples across the United States. We embrace the teachings of Amida Buddha and the Three Pure Land Sutras as interpreted by Shinran Shonen, a Japanese Pure Land Buddhist who lived between 1173 and 1263. We show our gratitude and take refuge in Amida Buddha by saying the Nembutsu, Namo Amida Butsu. Our aim is to spread the wisdom and compassion of Amida Buddha, striving for, for spiritual fulfillment and living a life of gratitude. Andrea, it's time to introduce our next guest for 2024. Thank you, Joe. Joining us today is Laverne Imori. Welcome, Laverne. Please take a moment to introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, everybody. As Andrea introduced me, I'm Laverne Imori. Currently, today, I am a member of the Buddhist Temple of San Diego. I have had the privilege of starting out my journey at uh, Seattle Betsuing under the ministry of Reverend Don Castro, and then moving to a Koji Buddhist Temple where um, I encountered uh, Reverend Kaz Nakata and then also Reverend Kurt Rye. All three of my experiences have been wonderful learning experiences in the Dharma. Excellent. Laverne, it's it's wonderful to meet you again. You and I had a chance to uh, attend a seminar at the Tacoma Buddhist Temple a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you mentioned Don Castro, you mentioned Seattle. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you got to the Seattle Betsuin? And when did you know it was the right spiritual path for you? I started, although I may look like a heritage Jodo Shinshu Buddhist, I'm not. Um, I grew up in a, a Judeo-Christian um, um, experience, and I came to Jodo Shinshu Buddhism about 20 years ago. And I was at a very um, low point uh, in my life, um, and I needed some guidance. And I happened, to, one of my... Um, relatives uh, was Jack Matsui, who was a lifelong member at um, Seattle. And so he always had said to me, come to temple, come to temple. And so 20 years ago, I thought, okay, well, I will try this. So I went there. It was a very watershed moment for me, if you will. I heard Reverend Castro's message. It was to the youth of the temple, and it was the story of the lotus. And that story of the lotus seed you know, that finds itself in mud. And yet through the mud, it draws um, nutrients to help itself grow. And then eventually also sees the light and grows towards that light. That was for me, a message of hope uh, that I needed to hear at the time. And it made me want to learn more about the Jodo Shinshu tradition. Laverne, it has been my experience that a fair amount of people find their way to Buddhism during a time of suffering. What would you say to that person who maybe will be listening to this interview and is suffering, but is maybe unsure if they would be welcome? So I remember um, at Ekoji, one of the things that Reverend Rai, one of the questions he would ask in his service is, what brought you here today? That question to me is still very relevant because we do see new faces coming. They're searching for something, just as I was searching for something. 
And what I would say to that individual is, you know, I'm not sure what you're going to hear today, but Jodo Shinshu is a path. It's a path for the ordinary person looking for meaning in their lives, looking for hope in their lives. And I think for me, uh, Jodo Shinshu was, and I mean this literally, a life-changing, a life-saving experience. And so I would say, keep coming. Um, you know, we say that our practice is mompo, deep listening, deep hearing. And I think as we continue to hear the Dharma, eventually, I think there is a message in there of hope, of, of understanding, of self-realization, of community, um, that will help us, I think, on this journey to really live our most authentic lives, our fullest lives, not just spiritually, but in all aspect of our lives. So I say keep keep coming, keep listening. Laverne, what motivated you then to move beyond that suffering to even pursue further studies in Buddhism, including enrolling in the correspondence course and joining the minister's assistant program? And then how have these experiences enhanced your understanding of our tradition? Well, first of all, I have to give a lot of credit to um, Reverend Castro. He encouraged me to attend the Introduction to Buddhism courses that they were offering in the evening. So I started out with those. Um, maybe he saw something in me that I just didn't realize, but I think he, he saw that I had this thirst you know, for learning more about it. And so the correspondence course, I think it was in its like second iteration. So this was a long time ago. And he said, you know, um, sign up, enroll for the correspondence course. And this was actually even before, now there's like long waiting lists um, for, to, to uh, enroll in the course. But so I thought, okay, you know, I can do this. And um, again, you know, just met with him periodically along the way became very intrigued. And one thing I will share with you is that when I took that first uh, semester, it was focused on like the larger sutra. And so, you know, the stories in the larger sutra. And my first reaction was, wow, do people really believe, you know, literally what they're reading? I mean, a lot of it is very um, fantastical, mythological, right? I tend to be a very literal person. So that was my first question. I thought, okay, I, I don't know if this is going to be a good fit for me. Um, so, but I kept at it. Two years went by really fast. I had some wonderful, wonderful teachers, including um, Bishop trying to, uh, Koto Umezu was one of my mentors. Uh, Kuahara Sensei was one of my mentors. Matsumoto, Bishop Matsumoto was one of my mentors. And so in those early days, we encountered some deeply, deeply um, faithful, deeply, deeply rooted um, teachers. And so I found myself really, really fortunate. And um, that motivated me, of course, you know, to, to study a little bit harder in those in those days, yeah, a lot, long time ago. But um, then uh, continuing to work with uh, Reverend Castro, um, he really was my first mentor, and he encouraged me to continue my studies. Um, he <laughs> He said, hey, Laverne, how would you like to be a minister's assistant? And so um, Irene Goto, who is still very involved and active in Seattle. So she and I chatted and we said, we'll be each other's support. So we enrolled in uh, the minister's assistant program. We were at that time, they had like map one, two, and we were map three. And I think we were that last sort of organized group of ministers assistants um, that went through that older program. But uh, it's been it's been a wonderful journey. So I blame <laughs> I credit Reverend Castro for getting me started on the path. In fact, my uh, homeo, my Buddhist name, Shido, um, basically means being on the path. So the beginning of the path. So and he's the one who uh, helped me discover that name. Laverne, small, small world, because Reverend Castro and and uh, Irene Goto uh, played a very mm -hmm. significant role in my uh, embracing Jodo Shinshu Buddhism as well. 
For those of us who are not familiar with the term, uh, what is Tokido ordination? And when did you receive yours? And did it make a, or mark a, a milestone of some sort in your Jodo Shinshu Buddhist path? Yeah, Tokido ordination was a very much a life changing um, moment uh, in my life, not just one moment, but just a time in my life. So Tokudo ordination is basically, you're, when you go through Tokudo ordination, you become a Jodo Shinshu priest in a very, of course, responsible way. They say it's like a Jodo Shinshu boot camp of sorts, but it was hard. It was hard. It was getting up very early in the morning, getting dressed. You had to dress properly. You had to put your, you know, um, your clothing away, very uh, folded, very perfectly uh, and do cleaning. I mean, everything was very much structured. Then we also went through a rigorous battery of testing. I was one of those that was so grateful to be supported by the more prepared members of my group. And then it culminated in the ordination service. Sort of replicate Shindan Shonin's experience when he was ordained in the evening at the age of nine. Of course, you know, we were so much older. The lighting was by candlelight and it was very ritualistic. I will always remember. You mentioned the Dharma and there may be people watching this uh, interview that don't have the background in Jodo Shinsho or in Buddhism that we have. You mentioned that the Dharma is Shinran Shonen's teachings. Is it more than that? Yeah, absolutely, of course. Shinran Shonen's teachings, of course, are rooted in Shakyamuni's, Shakyamuni Buddhist teachings, right? And I think that, especially in our services, I think we experience this, right? We experience hearing the broader uh, Buddhist teachings, right? Um, but then we also are focused on specifically Shindan's teachings, you know, through what we identify as his tradition of the seven, uh, his seven teachers, pre predecessors, if you will, who interpreted certain passages from the sutras that we identify with, the larger sutra, the smaller sutra, the Amida sutra, right? I think it is really important for us as Shin Buddhists to understand the basic do doctrinal teachings as transmitted um, through Shindan Shonin. But I also think it's very important for us not to lose sight of the broader Buddhist teachings. Um, and so how do we incorporate both teachings of the broader and then the more specific to Jodo Shinshu through Shindan. How do we bring that to our Sangha? How do we bring that to people that are seeking a spiritual path, if you will? All the temples are a little bit different and mm -hmm. present the Dharma in their own unique uh, way. How has your experience at the three different temples shaped your understanding and appreciation of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism? For me, I feel very, very fortunate and I feel very, very grateful for the experience because for me, it has been a wonderful journey. It's been a wonderful experience and it continues to be. It continues to evolve for me, if you will. So in Seattle, again, that was the start of my journey. Uh, like I said, I was not born into the Jodo Shinshu tradition. I had no idea who Shindan Shonin was. I, have n I had never heard of Jodo Shinshu. Um, Buddhism. I think for me, my Seattle phase, if you will, was one of really trying to learn, trying to understand, trying to really figure out how Buddhism, how Jodo Shinshu Buddhism specifically fit into my own experience, into my own life. 2012 was when I actually finally moved to Ekoji, January of 2012. Um, and I was really lucky that a Koji Buddhist temple was there in the middle of Virginia. Nakata Sensei was there for just about six months, and then he moved away. And then we didn't have a resident minister for a while until Kurt Rye 
uh, came to Ekoji. That was a wonderful experience for me because it helped me understand <laughs> a little bit more of what some of the ministers actually had to experience. When Reverend Rye came, I'll tell you, he was such a Dharma friend. Um, so I don't know how long I'd been there, but maybe two years. And so then uh, I became president of Ekoji <laughs> for two years. <laughs> and I will say that was one of the most difficult experiences for me. It was a time where we were really having to look inward and say, can we really continue a koji? So we put that question to the Sangha. And it was the year that we took on the EBL conference, of all things. And it was the year that I was preparing for Tokuro. So I, I will say that for 2014 especially, was the year that I had to ask myself, why am I doing all this? I was at a point, truthfully, where I was ready to step away from it all. Uh, there was some tremendous conflict uh, and some disagreements within the Sangha, as there are in all Sanghas everywhere. Not everybody agrees. You know, we might all have this co a common purpose, but we have different ways of approaching it. So I really question whether it was maybe time for me to step away. This wasn't working. It forced me to ask myself, why am I doing all this? Why? And it was the realization, it was because uh, Jodo Shinshu was a gift. Encountering Jodo Shinshu when I did was a gift. Uh, it truly was a life, life changer for me, lifesaver for me. And so for me, I think once I realized that, once I saw the gift of everything that I had experienced thus far, it was my point of recommitment if you will. And so it made my Tokudo experience, I think, even that much more meaningful. So um, that's, that's the Ekoji experience. Within the Jodo Shinshu tradition, we refer to the three treasures, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Could you discuss the importance of Sangha and how your perception of Sangha has evolved over time and why you refer to Sangha as your mirror? S so at Ekoji, Sangha was definitely my mirror. It was in the most difficult times that it became a mirror for me. It's easy for us to say, well, that problem was caused by this person or that person or this situation or that situation. It was at Ekoji that I realized that some of the issues that we might have been experiencing was due to my oversight or maybe uh, some of the things that um, I had said or done and that I had a role in it. And so that is where for me, the Sangha became so much more important because that Sangha became my mirror, my reflection, you know, um, to really not turn outward or to defend myself, but to look within myself and to take responsibility for my own part in whatever was happening in the greater Sangha. And not only that, but then to say, okay, how can we together, not just me, but together resolve some of these internal issues. Moving to uh, San Diego from Ekoji, it's a much more traditional temple. It has the, some of the traditional support groups, the BWA, for example, Junior YBA. And, and I see, you know, I see things happening within uh, the smaller groups and then within the larger Sangha. As I'm watching and I'm listening to some of the internal happenings, I, was, I also realized that a lot of what is happening within the Sangha is also happening within me, like my thoughts, my judgments, if you will. I, tend, I can be a very judgmental person and quick to judgment. And when I see that happening in somebody else, I'm, it's easy to say, well, that person's being judgmental, right? But then I have to say, oh, well, okay, well, then that's me too, because I have an opinion, I have a judgment. So the Sangha is such an invaluable resource to our own inner self-reflection journey. And I think which is so important in Jodo Shinshu, 
Laverne, when you and I met in Tacoma, we talked about end of life care for our parents. How did that experience uh, deepen your understanding of gratitude and its significance in the Jodo Shinshu tradition? I was very fortunate. Both my parents died at home. Dad passed away back in 1991, so it's it's been a few years. Um, we took care of him at home. And it was very difficult because we had to take care of all of his needs. We didn't have home hospice and it was humbling. I think, I think it was difficult for my dad to accept our help. What he taught me was gratitude because he had lost his ability to talk. And so I remember um, having to brush his teeth and, you know, that's very, that's a very personal experience, but saying to him, hey, dad, you know, I know this is really hard for you, but you took care of us when we were born and came into this world. And you did for us all of the things that we're now having to do for you. And we're doing it out of gratitude. Yes. So that was very humbling for me. And then my mom passed away in 2021 at the ripe old age of 101. My mother and I had a very difficult relationship. I have to say my mother was my bodhisattva. I have many lessons learned, life lessons learned from my mom, and I am so grateful. Even today, as I'm aging, I find things that are reminiscent of my mother as she was aging. You know, finding myself being less steady, you know, like when I walk, I was in Japan last year and walking on those gravel paths, I felt less balance less secure and i was reminded you know of my mother as she became uh weaker and less able to to support herself walking um i want to share a story about my mom in that you know we have this chanting group so this is my t-shirt here i'll just <laughs> we have we have a chanting group and um, my mother died on a saturday uh, we are we were zoo on Zoom and at when we started this chanting group Saturday at one o'clock. My mother died at 1.30 during the middle of chanting. So the last thing she heard was the Shoshinge, which we as Jodo Shinshu Buddhists mm -hmm. hope that we will hear the Shoshinge, right? They say that hearing is one of the last things to go. I see that as a gift from my mother. She was not totally supportive of me being so active in Jodo Shinshu, becoming a Buddhist priest, but I feel that that was her last gift to me. That was her gift to saying, it's okay, you know, thank you. So um, yeah, so that that was a lesson and a gift from her as she, as she died. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laverne. Those are all beautiful memories that you shared with us. You and I have that experience of going to temple uh, as seekers uh, early on in our experience, and it's very difficult to comprehend what's going on. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody who is just beginning to explore Jodo Shinshu Buddhism? I'm going to share something that actually have heard from uh, Dr. David Matsumoto. It may indeed be harder today to meet true teachers of the way, and yet... Paradoxically, we may also have many opportunities to encounter them if we listen with open minds and open hearts. And Dr. Matsumoto is uh, retiring as president of the Institute of Buddhist Studies. He was such an influential teacher for me. He lives the Dharma. Mm -hmm. And so I, what I would say to somebody who's new coming is to seek out those teachers uh, and they come in many forms. They come in the form of, of the both of you and of the individuals that you have interviewed. Um, uh, prior to me, I've listened to those and wow, talk about receiving the Dharma in many forms. Um, so yes, to, to continue to listen and to continue to seek. Thank you. How do you maintain a sense of gratitude and mindfulness amidst life's challenges and uncertainties? coming back to gratitude is really always the door for me. Sometimes in the midst of just the chaos of everyday living, I take a moment to center myself and it really all comes back to that sense of gratitude. Some days I cannot remember, I will be truthful. And I uh, challenge myself all the time, I am probably my biggest obstacle in life 
Uh, I so I keep at it because I'm hoping that one day I'll get it. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I don't know. But um, yeah, I I have so much to be grateful for. Laverne, let me ask a follow up question to that. What do you believe Jodo Shinshu Buddhism offers those of us who are living our everyday lives? It is a path that really encapsulates or just embraces our ordinary daily lives. I think that was uh, Shinran Shonin's quest, right? To share the Dharma with everyday ordinary people. And so I think that that is our gift from Shingon, um, that he introduced, if you will, Jodo Shinshu Buddhism for those of us that couldn't go to Mount Hiei, you know, and practice from morning until night, how to become enlightened. You know, he said, hey, uh, there is a path for us to achieve uh, spiritual awakening, just living our everyday lives. The practice of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism is deep, deep listening to the messages, to the teachings, and then as a result, the deep, deep gratitude that comes out of having encountered those teachings, you know, it's, it's what's encapsulated in the three treasures, right? Difficult is it to hear the Buddha Dharma, but wow, you know, we've encountered it. Aren't we lucky? Aren't we the lucky ones? Um, and so it's the joy, I think, that comes out of encountering all of that. We're down to our last two questions, and this has been just great fun. You and I recently attended a seminar. Uh, I mentioned this earlier in Tacoma. Uh, the speaker was Reverend Dr. Takashi Miyagi, and his talk was entitled The Joy of the Nambutsu Way of Life. And you just mentioned joy. Based on your personal experience as Jodo Shinshu Buddhist, where does the joy come from? It's funny that you bring this up because just yesterday we had a conversation about the joy of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism. And Shinran Shonin, you know, in his Kyogo Shinsho, he talks about that. You know, he says, how joyous am I having encountered, you know, all these teachings, all this, all this wisdom. I am so joyous that I was able to, in the last 20 years of my life, right, so far, uh, have encountered that. So Laverne, we always end our interviews with the same question. What does a koji mean to you? When I walk through the doors, I have a sense of a koji being, you know, the, uh, the gift of light, but it also means to me gift of having encountered so many fellow travelers on that path. So truly a koji is a gift to me in so, so many respects. So I am very grateful. Thank you for continuing a koji. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. For additional resources, visit ekoji.org BuddhistChurchesOfAmerica.org and Buddhist Temples of Canada at bcc.ca. Whether you're a dedicated scholar, a curious layperson, or simply interested in Buddhism's growing presence in North America, you'll discover a diverse array of materials from Buddhist texts, translations to engaging comic books for children at bdkamerica.org. Here at Akoji, our mission is to foster global unity within the Sangha through our in-person gatherings and streaming services. A special thank you to Laverne for sharing her experiences and insights. I'm Andrea Chapman, joined by Joe Gochi, and we sincerely appreciate your ongoing support and encouragement. Namo Amida Kusu.